but let's turn our hearts to the book of Revelation. We are in a series entitled 666. As for some of the new folk looking at the graphic like, oh my God, this is a church. This is a church. We are demystifying the book of Revelation because often we have these thoughts, we have these ideas that culture tells us that the Bible never told us about the end times and we're trying to demystify and debunk a lot of your thoughts around that and give you exactly what God is saying. Y'all ready for the word in the room? Amen. If you're ready for the word, say, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Y'all no, not really ready. If you're ready for the word, say, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let's go. I love the word of God. It's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto our pathway. Let's stand for the reading of the word. I have um, a number of scriptures to read today. And it may be a little lengthy, but for some folk, it's the most reading you did all month. Of the Bible, of the Bible, of the Bible. All right, that was a little mean. It's the, it's the most reading you did all week, okay? Um, let's start in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. John is writing. And he says, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Verse three, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven diadems or crowns on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. A war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, the devil, called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Remain standing. I'm going to pray quickly for our sermon today. But I want to preach from the subject false accusation false accusation God thank you for your word today I pray God that you would inform us that you would inspire us you would bring revelation to us and transformation we need you in this moment in our day in our culture and in these times God we can't do this without you show us your word God to give us power and authority and to complete your will in our lives. We thank you for our preaching time today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated all over the room. So the book of Revelation is a difficult book to preach. It is a difficult book to teach, but it is far more difficult to preach. And for some people... You may be jumping into the book today. You may be jumping into the book of Revelation at chapter 12. And jumping into this book in the middle is like jumping into the deep end of a pool and you can't swim. There's people in here that can't swim, so you can relate. 
Um, and what would it be like to go to a Broadway play or to watch a movie and start it in the middle? You wouldn't know the plot. You wouldn't know the characters. You wouldn't know the background. You wouldn't know the setup of the story. You would be coming into it midstream, and you would miss the context of what the writer, the producer, is attempting, attempting to give you. So my job today, my assignment, is to teach, to preach, and to prophesy. I like to preach, but sometimes you have to take a moment to teach. And I want to give you enough context so that you can come up to speed to where we are in this chapter in the book of Revelation. If you know something or have been listening, have been partaking of what we've been teaching, you know that the book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is John's revelation of Jesus, of God, and he sees Jesus standing in chapter 1, in the center of the seven churches. He sees Jesus as glorious. He sees Jesus as powerful. He sees him as mighty. Then in chapter 2, I hope y'all taking notes today. I need y'all to take notes today. Write it down. Take a, screen, a screenshot of what we have on the screens because I think it's going to be helpful for you. Helpful for you. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, you have the writing to the churches, the letter to the churches. In chapter 4, you have the glory around the throne. Something happens in chapter 5. In chapter 5, you see a cry going out in heaven. There is a question from the throne of God. Who will be able to take the scroll and the book and to loose its seals? Because the events of this timeline the end of days does not happen unless the scroll is loose God is sitting on the throne in chapter 5 and he has a scroll in his hands and it has seven seals and there is no one found worthy when heaven is searched and earth is searched. No one is found worthy except for the lamb that was slain. And John says the lamb that was slain, he had the power to take the scroll and to loose the seals. This scroll was in essence the title deed of the earth. The title deed, it, it showed who had ownership over the earth. And what we talked about is that God is the landlord and Satan is just the tenant. Mm -hmm. That God has leased this earth to Satan. Satan does not own the earth, the earth. Satan does not own the world. In fact, the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. And just because the enemy has access and some semblance of power does not mean he has ownership rights. And we see in chapter 5 that God is the landlord. He has the power to dictate what happens God sits on the throne the lamb takes the scroll out of his hands and the lamb begins to loose the seals chapter 5 is the demarcation is the place where the great trip or the tribulation period starts so if you're concerned and thinking about when does the tribulation start it starts when the church is raptured can I teach in here today? Y'all need this teaching. With all of the new age ideology going on, with all of what you read on social media, you need this teaching. The tribulation period is seven years. It does not happen until the church leaves. So if you're alive, then you are raptured. If you are dead in Christ, you rise first. So that should be good news for somebody today that was struggling with a pandemic because you were wondering whether or not we were in the tribulation. You, with all the people dying, you were concerned about maybe, I wonder if I was left behind. Have you ever wondered if you have been left behind? 
Uh, okay, I'm the only one. As a kid, I remember, right, going home, and my mom and my dad should have been home. And, and that was before cell phones. And you pick up the phone, you call them at work, you can't get them. And you look at your clock, and it's like, it's mighty late. And you start praying, you say, God, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did wrong. Maybe I missed the rapture. They come running in the door, and they're like, what's going on? I'm like, nothing, nothing. I don't know what's going on. I, I, I have been there, and it's a safe place today to admit that sometimes you have that friend, you have that parent that you know is really safe, and when you can't find them, you're like, what is going on? The tribulation period is seven years. It's divided into two parts. The first part is three and a half years. The second half is three and a half years. In chapter 6... You see the seals opened, four horses arrived, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. People start dying. Famine arises to epic proportions. We talk about a pandemic. In the tribulation, it will be an epidemic. Uh huh. You will be you will be looking for food and food will be hard to find. You'll go into the grocery store and you think there's a supply shortage today. It's nothing like it's where it's going to be in the tribulation period. In chapter seven, it talks about the hundred and forty four thousand. You need to read your Bible uh, because the Bible talks about this elect, this this um, group of Jews from 12 tribes, 12,000 people each in each tribe. They have the mark of God in their foreheads. They are a special group that is segregated during the tribulation period. So they are protected because they have the mark of God. That's why, and that is critical for your understanding, because when you walk through these streets and a Jehovah Witness comes up to you and says that we're the 144,000, you can look at your Bible and say, not so. Did I step on some toes right there? Some people in here. Um, so we went through all of this, and we started talking about what it means to be the elect, what it means to be connected to God. In chapter 9, the bottomless pit is open. And there are locusts that come out of the bottomless pit. These locusts are not the locusts that you see in the springtime or in the fall or even in the summer. These locusts are literal demons that have been released from the bottomless pit to disturb and to harm the inhabitants of the world. The Bible says for five months. So it lets us know two things, that there are demons right now currently housed in the bottomless pit, ready and willing to get out, but they can't get out because the key has not opened up the bottomless pit. It also tells us that they were set, they were released to inflict pain upon the earth for five months. It shows us something about the judgment of God, that even while God is judging, even when God is pouring out wrath, he is doing it in a structured way. It shows us that God is orderly in all of his doing. That when God is happy, he is systematized and he is structured. When God is sad, he is systematized and he is structured. And when God is pouring out judgment, he has order. God is always in control. And even when he allows demons to inflict pain, it's for a limited time because God has control not only of heaven, Heaven, but God has control over hell and that should give somebody consolation in the room today because your God is not aloof your God is not on a vacation your God is not somehow apathetic your God is in complete control and the devil cannot touch what God does not allow him to touch and even when God is judging the earth and judging the world God is 
is still in complete control. And you would think that because demons are released, you would think that because locusts are released, they have the ability to do whatever they want to do. But God says, no, you got five months. And then after that, your time is up. And maybe I can transliterate that same passage into my current world because if God gives the devil a time limit in a future case then maybe God gives the devil a time limit in my current world I want to let somebody know right here I feel like preaching already but I want to teach I want to let somebody know right here that maybe the devil is afflicting your family but he can only go so far and when God says time is up the devil's time is up can somebody give God glory right there for a God that keeps everything under control a pandemic did not catch him by surprise scarcity does not catch him by surprise your God is in control he's in control he's in control you see God gets angry and he's under control. You get angry and you cuss somebody out. You're, you're not like God. His anger is smooth. His anger is systematic. His anger is structured. He has limits. You get angry and you throw things. You get angry and you quit your job. God is angry, and he says, this is the line. So in chapter 12, it is the intermission. John sees a vision in chapter 12 of a woman and Satan, of, a, of the woman and the dragon. This is a picture of Satan entering the tribulation period at the three and a half mark. The first three and a half years of the tribulation period will be a time of peace in all of what's going on, even though food will be uh, hard to find, there will be peace because an antichrist will rise up and he will be the sweet talker, the smooth charlatan, and he will bring peace to the earth, and all will follow him. And the Jews will say, finally our Christ has come. He'll set up a kingdom in Jerusalem, and the world will look to him because he brings peace to a region that is in perpetual war. Right now, there's a war going on in the Middle East. Ever, ever since I've been alive, there's a war going on in the Middle East. And, and, and this Antichrist, brings peace to a place that we've never seen have peace before. So all will follow him. All will bow down to him. And you might be saying, you might be saying, well, pastor, I'm going to take my chances. I feel like if I'm here when all that's going on, I'll stand up for Christ. I won't bow down to an antichrist. I won't. I won't take the mark. I, I won't serve him. I'll stand for Jesus. May I remind you about 18 months ago what happened to your faith? When, when millions of people were dying in America and you said, I don't want to go to church? <laughs> uh, uh, when, when a pandemic broke out, you ran away from God instead of running to God. And you think you're the one that's going to stand in the middle of a tribulation. The Bible shows us, and there's a scripture that we read, I believe in Bible study last week, that with all of the murder and 50% of the population is wiped out, the Bible says they still did not repent. They still did not look to God. 
And I was wondering before a pandemic, because I've been studying the book of Revelation for over a decade. And before the pandemic, I wondered and I looked at that scripture and I said, God, how in the world could people not repent with everything that's going on? That was before the pandemic. After the pandemic, I can see it. Yeah. 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 Because all the people that said they loved God ran away from God. All the people that said, you know what, I should be in church, stayed home. All the people that said, you know what, I need to just sit here and I can do life without a community, without a group of, of believers around me, and I can find my own way. That's the mentality that will be prevalent in the tribulation period. I'm still teaching. Still teaching. In Revelation 12, the woman appears. Who is this woman? Michelle, if you can put that slide up with the woman and the dragon. What do we know about this woman? Who is she? Is she a, a, a picture or a metaphor for the church? She can't be a picture for the church or a metaphor for the church because, number one, the church is raptured. Number two, the church is never seen or depicted in the scriptures as a pregnant woman. You'll never see in your Bible where the church of God is like a pregnant woman. They're the bride of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. You are a virgin of Christ. And we are betrothed or engaged to Christ currently. When we are raptured and we make it to heaven, then we are married to Christ at the marriage supper. So we are not pregnant, and this cannot be the church. Well, when we start dissecting how John describes this woman, we see she has 12 stars in her crown. We also see that she has a male child, and this male child rules with a rod of iron. Sounds like somebody. This male child is caught up into heaven after he is born in the earth. Sounds like somebody. This sounds a lot like Jesus. So if this child depicts Jesus, then who is the woman? The woman has to be Israel. It cannot be Mary. It has to be Israel because there are 12 stars in the crown. 12 tribes of Israel. If you keep reading the book, this woman flees into the wilderness, and for three and a half years, the dragon is attempting to inflict pain on the woman. It represents Israel. Then you have the dragon. This dragon in chapter 12 is somebody and something we need to take a look at. I spared you all the images today because I know we have some young kids probably in our congregation, but this great dragon had seven heads and ten horns. And who is this dragon? The Bible says it is Satan, the devil. That's clear because the Bible tells us that in verse 9. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to try and figure it out. John tells you this dragon represents Satan. He has power. He has seven heads. We talked about seven in the book of Revelation means completion. So he has complete power in his domain. And he has ten horns, the ability to inflict pain and power on those heads, which means ten kings. And we'll see that later in the book of Revelation. I'm still teaching. Y'all still with me? Then the dragon doesn't go after the woman. In verse 4, the dragon goes after her child. So we realize then something about this dragon. If you could put verse 4 on the screen. Something about this dragon is notable. That the dragon goes after the child of the woman. He's not after the woman. He's after what's coming out of the woman. We see a characteristic of Satan. That sometimes Satan doesn't come after you. He comes after what's connected to you. We see a characteristic of the devil. 
that the devil can he can see and forecast your future he can see and forecast the legacy that is connected to you and that's why you have so much friction and frustration around your purpose and it's difficult for you to produce something coming out of your spirit it's difficult for you to start the business it's difficult for you to start the ministry it's difficult for you to get legacy in your family because the enemy goes after the child of the woman and you don't have to be a woman in here to know that you are spiritually pregnant with somebody with something with some destiny with some greatness with some idea with some power in the earth that to know that you were made for more than what you are currently experiencing and I'm wondering right here in this part of the sermon is there anybody in the room that feels spiritually pregnant with something great on the inside of you but you are feeling like I'm wondering if I can give birth to this dimension of anointing and ministry because I feel the gates of hell trying to come against my destiny and my purpose but I want to push somebody in the room right now you have got to birth that thing that God has put inside of you you cannot allow a hater you cannot allow a Facebook post you can't allow your boss to stop you from what God has put inside of you you have got to birth that thing somebody shout in the room birth that thing you got to push that thing out. If you have to pray, push it out. If you have to cry, push it out. The text tells us that she birthed this male child with great pain. And sometimes pain is the precursor to purpose. Mm -hmm. Sometimes pain is the prerequisite for purpose. And even though you are struggling right now, you got to push that thing out and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him I wish I had a church in the room today that Satan cannot have your seed Satan cannot have your idea Satan cannot have your purpose Satan cannot have your destiny the Bible shows us that this male child was caught up into heaven and the thing about it is that when God is all over your stuff it's like the devil can't find it it's like the devil can't touch it it just vanishes because God says you cannot touch my anointed and you cannot do them no harm I wish I had anointed people in the room today don't let the jersey fool you today I come with power and anointing don't let the jersey fool you today I'm not playing with a devil today I'm not playing with a demon today and I came to give you power I came to fly every trap of the enemy and I feel the anointing in the room this is exactly what you need to make it through your week this is exactly what you need to make it through next month this is what you need you have been depressed for too long oh I feel God already I feel God already, already the child of the woman is, is protected in the wilderness. For three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation period, there is the elect of God that will be in the wilderness and protected from the power of Satan. That is just like God. If you're wondering how does he do that, I want to take you to Exodus. For when the children of Israel were incarcerated in Egypt, God raised up Moses to release plagues. And if you notice something specific about that story, the plagues only inflicted pain against the Egyptians. But the Israelites that were living in Goshen, they were living in a protected place. So every plague that swirled in the atmosphere of Egypt could not penetrate the gates of Goshen because they were in a protected place. Y'all don't understand the power of God's protection. 
that there can be all type of craziness and hell going on on your job but because you exist in a protected place they will get laid off but you won't and if you get laid off God will give you something better because you live in a protected place you need to start living your life knowing that you are protected that even though the stock market crashes it does not affect the money of the kingdom because God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory and even though gas prices probably will go up in the summer it will not affect what God is going to put on your table because I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread you are protected slap your neighbor high five and say you are protected come on come on prophesy to them wake them up tell them you are protected you are protected I'm going to shift now from teaching to preaching and shift into impartation. I gave you some information. Let's get some uh, impartation. In verse 7, if you can put verse 7 up, please, it says, a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and that dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Michael. Michael is an archangel, and whenever you see Michael in the scriptures, he is the leader of a host of angels. He's like the general. And we can piggyback on June, Jude, the book of Jude, chapter 9, sorry, not chapter 9, verse 9. The book of Jude only has one, one chapter. Verse 9, if you reference that scripture, the Bible says that Michael and the devil, they were wrestling and fighting over the body of Moses. <laughs> because if you know your Bible, Moses died, but his body is hidden. And Satan wanted to get to the body of Moses, but Moses' body is untouchable. He cannot find it. It's in the earth, but he cannot find it. It's in the earth, but he cannot find it. It's in the earth, but he cannot find it. That tells me that the devil has jurisdiction in a place where he cannot go into every corner. Uh huh. That, that the devil has a lease, but there are certain spaces that he cannot enter. There are realms in the earth that are locked to the enemy. And the Bible says that Michael and the and Satan were fighting. Uh huh. And the body of Moses was hidden. And Michael stands up and says to Satan, the Lord God rebuke you. He has power over Satan when he says the Lord rebuke you. Michael does not rebuke Satan with his own power. Michael does not try and use his own name. But Michael, he leapfrogs into the authority of God. He pulls on the anointing of someone greater than him. And and he transplants it upon the enemy and he says the Lord rebuke you you know how to cast out a devil don't try and do it by yourself you gotta say in the name of Jesus I cast you out you know how to get authority in the atmosphere of your home you gotta use the name of Jesus no sage no plant will give you authority will cleanse your house you got to use the name you have to use the authority authority of God and you have to say I feel a little weird today it's like I can't sleep that's not the time to pick up a plant that's the time to start praying and say devil you gotta get out my house you gotta get out my mind the Lord rebuke you the Lord rebuke you ah I hope I can finish this yeah. they're fighting but where are they fighting, y'all? They're fighting in heaven. Hold up. Hold up. 
Hold up, Freddie. How are they fighting in heaven? I thought that Satan was kicked out of heaven. Read your Bible. I thought that he didn't have access to heaven. Well, verse 10. Well, no, let's not go verse 10 yet, Michelle. There was a place in heaven that they were fighting. And it was Satan versus Michael, Satan's crew versus Michael's crew. And they were fighting. How in the world did Satan get back in heaven? <laughs> you don't know your God. How? Why would God allow him back? I don't want to hurt your theology. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But if I was God, there's no way he's coming back. When somebody walks out of my life, keep on walking. Do I have a witness in a, in a building? You don't let somebody in your space that you know is a liar, that you know doesn't have your best interest at heart. But there's a war in heaven. It tells me then that Satan is a spirit, number one. He is a spirit, number two. He is not omnipresent like God is. But he has to exist somewhere. At a particular point in time, he has to be in a place. He cannot be in your house and my house too. Did I, did I burst the circuit boards of your consciousness? Satan cannot be in your house and in my house too. His demons can. Because the Bible says when he fell, in eternity past, he drew down a third of, of the angels. So there are a third of whatever the amount is of the angels in heaven. He brought them with him. So it tells me that he has a lot of friends. He has a lot of demons at his disposal. And, he, and the kingdom of darkness is regimented. So Satan is not going to come visit you if you are considered light work to him. Oh, he has demons for that. He's not going to disturb you on your job. And he has bigger fish to fry. He is systematic. He's not disorganized like you. You are so egotistical that you want to do everything by yourself. And you don't know the power of a team. But Satan says, I got a team with me. And most people, including myself, have never encountered, encountered rather Satan. Never. Never encountered Satan. I've encountered demons. Never encountered Satan. Because there's levels to this. Somebody say there's levels to this. I don't even want to. Some of y'all in here acting like you got it going on. Most of us have never encountered Satan. Why? Number one, because we haven't risen to that level of rank. Number two, because he's busy doing something else. <laughs> he's busy. The Bible says that he is the accuser of the brethren. Verse 10, Michelle, I believe it's verse 10. It says that he is the accuser of the brethren day and night. So, Rel, he spends most of his time accusing you. Before God, he's in heaven accusing you. <laughs> we understand this theologically because the book of Job gives us a picture of this. When, when the sons of God, the angels, present themselves before God, Satan comes with them to give a report. And God says to Satan, where have you been? He says, I've been walking through the earth to and fro. 
So there are times when Satan has to report to God. And when he reports, he brings accusation. And I came for somebody today because I wanted you to see that the enemy you're fighting is an accuser. And he spends his time building his case of accusation. And he says to God, God, look at your daughter. She says she loves you. She doesn't really love you, God. Look at how she doesn't pray. She doesn't really love you, God. Look at how she is driven and ruled by anxiety. And with every block, he begins to build a case of accusations. Yes, yes. He spends his day and night saying to God, God, they really don't have your heart. Look at how they serve their jobs more than they serve you. They, they really don't have your heart, God. If they had your heart, they wouldn't be that worried, that depressed. God, look at how they're angry at you. They're angry at you because they didn't get the job they wanted. <laughs> they're angry at you, God, because they didn't get the promotion they wanted. And, and the, the, the devil, Satan, is in heaven right now accusing you. And, and he's building accusation on top of accusation on top of accusation. And he begins to tell God all of these stories. He said, God, I've been watching them. Have you been watching them, God? I, I, I've been watching that man, that man that secretly goes on those websites at night. Late at night, he's on those websites he shouldn't be on, God. And, and he lifts his hands on Sunday, but he puts down his hands on Monday. And he accuses you. He points out to God every wrong turn you make. He points out to God every problem, every concern, every time you trip and you fall every time you should have been reading your Bible and you didn't read your Bible. And he builds the case. He stacks the deck. He goes before God. He goes in the courts of heaven and he has access. Mm -hmm. And he says, God, I got a report for you. Look, look at her. Look at all the times. She didn't trust you. He accuses you of not being real. He accuses you of being a fake Christian. You're a fake Christian. You're not a real one. He accuses you of not being a real leader. You're only a leader on social media. And he builds an entire case of accusation. And the reason why you are afflicted so much in your mind is because he regurgitates the accusations that he renders in heaven. He regurgitates them to his demons and they come and speak negativity into your mind. And you, you walk through your life and you say, maybe I am that much of a liar. Maybe, maybe I can't get free from depression. Maybe I can't make it out of this financial hole. Probably because the last time I was in financial trouble, I did steal from the company. I, I, did, I did take a little something. The last time I was in financial trouble, I, I, I did cheat on my taxes. I went to Pookie and Ray Ray in the street because they could give me a deal. And I lied on my taxes to get a better refund. And you start to believe 
the accusations of the enemy. But the Bible says this, that they overcame, number one, by the blood of the lamb, and number two, by the word of their testimony. So I got news for the super deep folk in the room. The blood of the lamb is one part in the overcoming phase that you need in order to get victory over the enemy. See, the blood of the lamb is enough to save you. You will go to heaven. You will see Jesus one day. You are saved by grace. You don't have to work for it. You just have to have faith. Uh, by grace are you saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest you boast. But salvation is not the same thing as overcoming. And I wanted to show somebody today that number one, it's the blood of Jesus that gives you access to victory. But you don't obtain victory unless you use your testimony. The blood of Jesus is the pathway to victory. But you will always be struggling in the earth realm and never have victory over the enemy and his tactics if you don't become a testimony. So God allows the enemy to stack the deck. He allows the enemy to make the case. He allows you to be abused. He allows you to fall out with your friends. He allows you to be forsaken. He allows you to go through a divorce. He allows you to go through pain. Because God knows how to flip the script. He wants the enemy to accuse you because God knows that the accusations are false. He knows they are false because of the source that it's coming from. And the enemy is incapable of telling the truth. Even though it may be truth in reality, it's false because of where it's coming from. So you did go through depression, but you are not depressed because if the enemy says you are depressed, he's a liar. And the, the Bible says he is the father of lies. And anything that comes out of the enemy's mouth is a lie. It is a lie. So the blood of the lamb, the word, the word of your testimony, the word of your testimony, the word of your testimony. And one of the things you have to do is use your pain to your advantage. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it around for your good. So when he says you are a cheater, yes, I'm a cheater, but God is for me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? And the problem we're having is that we are accepting the accusations of the enemy. And the reason why you're not free isn't because you don't want to be free. You're not free because you're not free in your mind. And you have not used what the enemy is coming with against him. It's an accusation, but it's false. Because... I'm lonely, but my Bible says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I'm not really lonely. It's a false accusation. And the way to dismantle the enemy's accusations and make it false is to be a testimony. So you have to have a test for it to turn into a testimony. And too many Christians want to be exempt from pain and struggle. If you're going through this life, you will have trouble. But God knows how to work all things together for your good. It must become a testimony. But what I've learned is that even though the enemy has a good case. I've learned that he builds his case 
on a good accusation. He builds his case on something that happened in the root of your life. It's, it's built on a lie that is metastasized and built and morphed into greater accusation. So he takes what happened to you when you were seven, what happened to you when you were 10, and he perpetuates that and builds his whole case on it. There's only a few things in your life that you need to get free from. And if you can get free from the major thing, it will transform everything and everyone and who you are. So there's a major block that is holding everything up. Maybe it's the abuse. Maybe it's the abandonment. And if you can find that one thing, if you can find that one thing, you will dismantle the false accusations of the enemy. I'm ready to prophesy now. I prophesy to somebody in the room that if you can ever get over what happened to you at the bottom, the deep thing, hallelujah, the deep brokenness, you will learn that it's a false accusation. And the more that you can find help and safety, and who God has created you to be. You can tear down every accusation of the enemy by saying, God, I will confront what I've been running from. I will confront what they said about me. And I will be everything who God created me to be. You've got one block. You've got one block. One block, one pain, one pain that is so deep in you. If you can move that, if you can use your life to be a testimony. Some people in here have been abused. You are abused not for you. You are abused so that you can help somebody else who is going through trauma. There's a ministry in you. And I prophesy to somebody today, you got to find that ministry. And when you find it, the enemies camp the enemy's tactics will be torn down i need somebody in the room today that knows you're a testimony that knows you were created for more i need somebody in the room let's go dj i need somebody to know and i prophesy right now that the devil tried to kill you the devil tried to take you out but it's a false accusation what you're feeling like right now how they hurt you it's false it's a lie and just like the enemy has been doing all of his existence he's doing it to you right now but i came to release somebody in the name of jesus i came to deliver somebody in the name of jesus i came to set somebody free i dare somebody to begin to pray right now all over the room I dare somebody to stand on your feet and begin to reach out to God and say God it's false it's false what they're talking to me about and how they are portraying me it's false what I'm hearing in my mind that's giving me insomnia it's false and God you have called me to be a testimony and I will declare that I am the righteousness of God and how you get free you have to open your mouth and declare the word and say I am above and not beneath I am more than a conqueror I dare somebody right now to declare life to your situation to declare life to your circumstance I need somebody to open your mouth in the room open your mouth in the room prayer team let's go lights please Yes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. It's a false accusation. And I want to call somebody out of their seat right now. You need prayer so that you can finally become a testimony. Somebody else, 
You need victory so that you can overcome those thoughts. Somebody else, I, I, speak, I speak life right now and I declare a freshness over your soul. Uh -huh. Somebody has to get free from it today. Somebody has to get loosed from it today. It's a false accusation. You are a good husband. You are a good father. You are the mother that God created you to be. You are, you are, you are. I need somebody to declare the power of God right now. You have to come for prayer. You have to. Your next week depends on it. Yes, sir. Your next month depends on it. You have to get free because you can't overcome this unless you embrace your testimony. Embrace who God created you to be. I am a testimony. And I believe in the blood of the Lamb. But I believe in the Word. The Word. The Word. The Word. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to give somebody an opportunity to give their life to Jesus today. If you're in the room and you're tired of being a slave to the accusations of the enemy, I wanna give you an opportunity to lift your hand at the count of three, lift your right hand. If you wanna give your life to Jesus and make him the Lord and savior of your life, and you wanna be free from sin, and you wanna accept salvation today, one, two, three, raise your right hand. Is there anybody in the room? Is there anybody in the room that needs to give their life to Jesus? We thank you, God. We give you praise today, God. I declare that the enemy is lost again. I declare that the enemy is lost again. I declare that the enemy has lost again. I declare that this brokenness won't take you out. I prophesy that this brokenness won't be the end of you. But you're making all things new today, God. You're making all things new today, God. We thank you for victory. It's false. That narrative is false. That projection is false. You're going through pain, but that pain is about to turn into power. You are the blessed of God. And so God, we pray in this room today. We pray for your people all over this room. God, we don't preach this sermon fear. We preach this sermon for faith. And I'm asking you right now to do a work. Show us where our testimony is. Show us where our purpose is. Show us where our power is, God. Show us where our victory is. God, we thank you for your blood. But God, we pray that you would mold us into a testimony. We need to be yours. We need to be completely yours. And so, God, we thank you today. We thank you for your omnipotence. We thank you for your grace. Because grace, God, is what brings us into your victory. And we embrace every bit of grace for our situation today. And we thank you, God, because you have caused us to triumph. We honor you today. We give you glory today. We give you power today. We give adoration to you today. We exclaim you as powerful. And we honor you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Somebody give God glory. Somebody give God glory. Somebody give God glory. Somebody give God glory. I feel strength rising. Somebody give God glory. I feel a testimony in the room. Somebody give God glory. I feel a testimony in the room. You're about to step into a season where people won't just see the pain or the test, 
but they'll see the testimony in your life. I dare somebody to give God glory. Come on, open your mouth, open your mouth. It's the word of your testimony. How do you combat the false accusations? You got to open your mouth and give God glory and give God praise. Because God, I am a walking, talking, living, breathing testimony. And I thank you today, God. And we give you glory today. I declare you are free today. You are free today. And what God wants from you is to start using what you've been through to make a difference. Using your education to make a difference. Using your experiences to make a difference. So we preach the book of Revelation here. Not so that you would fear God and come to God out of fear. Because anybody that comes to God out of fear and transplants that into faith, it's really bondage. That's why so many people are bound in church. Because you came to God for the wrong reasons. You came to God to escape hell. You didn't come to God because you love heaven. So we don't talk about revelation so you will fear God, but that you would love him even more. And I release faith in the room today. Clap your hands. We got a roll. Did you have a good time today? Thanks for watching our service today. We hope and pray that you are encouraged. We love to give here at Link. There are two convenient ways to give to our church. You can text the number 84321 or give online at linkchurchnc.org forward slash give. Join us next week for Link Online. We pray that you have a great and blessed week.